there's a really good story in the scriptures that talks about Jesus walking along the beach, you know, and here he's got his disciples with him, you know, and they've pretty much figured out that he's the Son of God. And they don't completely understand that yet, but they kind of get it, you know, that he's risen from the dead, but he's still a man. They've touched him, and they've talked to him, and they've even eaten with him, and they have heard him speak the same way as he did before he died, and here he is walking along, talking to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee in the one place where they all loved and knew and were very familiar with because they had grown up there. At least most of them had. And so Jesus is walking along with his disciples and you uh, get this picture of John and Peter walking along, you know, and Jesus has got some things to talk to Peter about, you know, because Peter's feeling really down and out, you know, because he's kind of blown it along the way. And you've been there, you know what it's like, you know, you kind of like thought you were going to do something, you know, and you didn't turn out the way you thought. God has to come along and say, look, it's okay, I got you covered, you know, this is what I wanted to do, this is how it worked out, and this is what I did. So that way it's covered, so you can just go forward. And so you do. Well, Jesus is talking to Peter, and it's kind of interesting is that, you know, Jesus is kind of mentioning things, and, and, uh, telling them about the end of the world and how things are going to happen, you know, and how there'd be some present that wouldn't die before the Son of Man returns. And Jesus is getting ready to leave them. And so, Peter goes, but, but wait a minute. And he looks over at John, you know, and he says, well, what about him? Because it was obvious that there was a certain amount of jealousy that went on among the disciples because Jesus as we are told, loved John. And John recorded the disciple whom Jesus loved and that there was always one that Jesus seemed to pay a little more attention to for whatever reason. Now, did he play favorites? Seems like it to me. <laughs> you can take that as far as it goes, but don't blow that out of proportion because just because someone focuses in on you at a certain amount of time doesn't mean that you're the favorite. just means that you're the person that God spent time with on a consistent basis. So sometimes people blow things out of proportion, interpreting it to what they would do, not opposed to what God had done. You always have to kind of put that in perspective because God's thoughts aren't our thoughts, neither is His ways our ways. So, in this teaching, it's kind of interesting because you get Jesus walking along talking and here Peter gets distracted by John because he wants to know, well, what about this guy? You know, what, what are you going to do with this guy? And Jesus makes an interesting statement. He says, don't worry about him. Follow thou me. You follow me. You keep your focus and put your attention on me. You keep the direction in the right path and you won't trip up. You keep your attention on me and you'll be fine. But if you look to the right or the left, if you look somewhere else at someone else, you're going to blow it. And you see, that's where Christians today are blowing it. They're making the mistake of looking around at people and comparing themselves or looking at people and criticizing them. I know that there's a particular ministry like, uh, I think it's like Jan Markle or you know, a bunch of these prophet people or prophecy people that really are kind of like a cliche group. You know, they want to group themselves together and have these cute little kind of mutual congratulation parties, you know, where they're all talking about how they can pick out what's wrong with everybody else's theology. And they're fine, of course. They can tell everyone what's wrong with everyone else, but they can't see what's wrong with themselves. And that's the problem with looking at and pointing at anything else but Jesus. You see, the focus of our attention ought to be the fullness of the prophecy, Jesus. We shouldn't be looking for the Antichrist. We shouldn't be looking for the Great Tribulation. We shouldn't be looking for any of these things. We should be looking for Jesus. And that's what happens to Christians often. They lose focus. They say, well, I really don't want to pay attention to the Gospel. I really want to do something else, you know. I, I'd like to go get involved in politics, you know. I can be a Christian and be political, can't I? Oh, you know, 
that Jesus stuff, you know, that's nice, but you know, I'd kind of like to get involved with, you know, kind of like, uh, I want to be a football player and a baseball player, so let me concentrate on that and give God the glory, but, you know, I'd rather do that than witness to my team or tell them about Jesus. I don't have Bible study, for God's sakes, not with my fellow players. After all, they're not going to come anyways, they're partying. You know, after game parties. What we do with the direction of our own heart is our own, but the footsteps are ordered of the Lord. God said to Peter, one of his own closest disciples, you don't get distracted. Don't pay attention to what's going on with John. What does it matter if I spare him or I want something special for him or I want to do something with it? You pay attention to what you are being told by me to do. And that's where Christians have to focus in on their relationship sometimes over their religion. Because everybody has a religion. They have a, a way that they organize their life into some pattern of response to God in some way. If you go to church or you read your Bible, you've got religion, period. That's just the way it is. But in order to not make it religious, but to make it religion, you have to add God in it, the G, and make it a part of your relationship so that it's a part of God being involved in your life as you seek Him and walk with Jesus daily. Because if you lose focus, if you get distracted, you get into religion. And religion always is trying to change and rearrange and fix and correct and make different what people are doing with their lives. Do you really want to do that? I mean, I don't know about you, but haven't you seen enough of all these people pointing the fingers? You know, I mean, one minute they're pointing at you, next minute they're pointing at them, then they're pointing at this guy and that guy. And they're never pointing to Jesus, are they? If you look at what people point at, they often don't want to build something up. They want to tear something down. They don't look at it and say, let me come and help you. They say, no, you come to me and I will fix it for you. You do what I'm telling you to do. They don't say, well, look, this is wrong. Now you go ask Jesus and you go do whatever God tells you to do. See the difference? The difference in our ministry is that that's what we do often. We keep telling people over and over and over and over and over and over again. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You lean not in your own understanding. You in all your ways acknowledge Him and you be directed by God. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. Don't go by what me, if I ever was stupid enough to tell you to do something, I would tell you to seek the Lord while He may be found. Today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart as it says in the provocation, you must have that relationship with God because men will tell you what to do. That's not their job. Their job is to inspire you to seek the Lord. Their job is to conspire around you the circumstances to create in you the environment that you want to find out what God would say. That you would use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and you would hear His voice and you would know the Lord your God and you would have God in you directing you. You see, Emmanuel means God in us. And that means that God is directing your life in every single way, shape, and form of your life. That He is the one that is fulfilling your life. Because First John says, He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. I didn't say it. God said it. God did it. God gave you the grace to be saved. God gave you the mercy. God gave you the forgiveness. But what are you going to do with it? Are you going to look around and say, Now, nah, you know, I don't want to be a Christian because look at all those other Christians. Or, you know, I don't want to be like that part of Christianity because look at them. Or are you going to look at Jesus? Like Jesus told Peter, don't look at John. You look at me. You do what I tell you to do. Every single human being will stand before God. On that day, no one's going to ask you who you followed. They'll know. God and all the angels in heaven will know because they have watched you all the days of your life. They will be obviously and apparent to each and every single being without the universe that all of creation, while it waited and watched for the revelation of the sons of God, was also either appointed for rejoicing that you found your way or that you ignored the way that God had told you to go today. 
You see, creation wants you to succeed. It groans in travail waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. You were meant to be and you were called and chosen to become a son of God. You were a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a people of God if you are with and in God. If God is with you, then God would be in you and God would direct you and you would not be disobedient, but rather faithful to He who created you and who has called you out of darkness into His light. That's why you don't point fingers at other people. That's why you don't go after other ministries. That's why you don't do what the other guy does. You do as God tells you to do. Follow thou me, Jesus said. And he says it to you today. Follow thou me. Don't look at Christianity. Don't look at some other church. Don't look around for the grass to be greener on the other side of the hill. Because God wants you to look at the man who created the grass. He wants you to see the man who walks on the hill. He wants you to know those people that God has placed in your life to direct you to himself, not to themselves. So you would see not Peter, James, John, Paul, theology, books of the Bible, the Bible, even religion itself, but rather you would see Jesus. Because you see, that's what the love of God does. If you love something, you want to see the object of your love. You want to see the person you have fallen in love with. You want to be in their presence. You want to enjoy their fellowship. You want to walk with them and talk with them on a daily basis. You can't get enough of them. Whenever Christians take their eyes off of Jesus, whenever they leave their first love, whenever they get off target, off focus, look around, pay attention to anything else other than Jesus, you already know what the responses are. You've seen them. You are a participant in them, probably, and you have done it yourself, most likely. Because if you're like any other human being, you have times where you sit down and you go, nah, I'm going to watch a football game. Nah, I'm going to go you know, play baseball. Nah, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. And so you took your eyes off of God for a while. But you know, God said you don't have to do that. He said, you don't have to leave me behind. You can recognize that I am in you. You can know that I am with you. You can be aware that I am everywhere, always. And that in all things, know that if you would walk with me and recognize that I am there, then wherever you go, whatever you do, and all the things that you are and all the things that you become, then you would know me because I've been with you from the beginning and I'll be with you all through to the end. Don't get your eyes off of Jesus. Don't lose focus in these days that we live in because everything is meant to distract you and attract you. What's that? Where? What? Huh? Oh, somebody calls you on your smartphone and you got to pay attention. Somebody texts you and you hear the little warning text message. The little... <laughs> well, God sent you a warning a long time ago. He's coming. He sent you a warning on a regular basis every time, texting to you, telling you again and again. He's coming. Jesus is coming, but he's looking for those who are looking for him. He's watching to see if you're paying attention to him. He's speaking so that you would hear him, so that when it comes time, come. Follow thou me. Come unto me. Come. If Jesus today spoke to you in a still small voice and whispered, come, and that determined whether or not you were going to go in a rapture or not, would you hear him? While you're standing there talking with your earbuds, while you're listening to your worship music cranked up as loud as it can be in your car, while you're paying attention to every other thing than God, will you hear him when he says, come up hither, come? Or will you be left behind because you weren't listening to, you weren't looking at, you weren't focused in on Jesus today? God is a jealous God. He would have no other gods before him. He would have no other attention-getting 
idols, fleshy monuments to man-made concepts and man-made inventions that he himself has provided for us. When I look at a sunrise, it's obvious that God created the sun. When I look at the stars of the universe and the sky at night, it's obvious that God created the universe. When I look at my own flesh and blood, it's obvious that God created me. Because of things so obvious that God created, man has to recreate so many things in creation to distract us from the fact of God's creation and God's reality that is all around us. So man recreates creation into his own image by making things man-made. And anything that you have that doesn't direct you to God distracts you from God and points you in the wrong direction. Refocus your attention. Redirect the attention of your spirit back unto God. Return or repent back to the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength today. And let Him direct you today in everything you do, everything you hear and see and say. Because that's the way that God is living and alive. He wants you to know Him in a personal and intimate way. And He wants you to relate to Him every day of your life. Not just on Sunday when you think that you need Him. But every day because the reality is those are the days you need Him. Every day.